Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by Steel Turkington in Sydney, Australia. Steel, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good, man. This is awesome. Um, we are basically in different days. Like, you're a day ahead of me because I'm in yeah, Cincinnati, I'm, Ohio. And you're, I'm in your future. <laughs> you're in my future. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty far it looks. Out. It looks good for you. Excellent. Cool. It's full of There's, drums. Yeah, and, good, uh, th- good things in store. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, yeah, so today we are talking about uh, something a little bit different than we normally talk about, but it's um, kind of encompasses everything. It's restoring and preserving these beautiful vintage drums that basically every episode is about. So, um, and I know you're the guy to talk to. You have quite the experience in uh, keeping these these beautiful drums from disappearing from the earth. Thank you. Yeah, so I just think you have a really cool way of looking at the whole process of just not letting drums disappear. And I think a lot of people might be interested in your process and what you do. And if if you find a drum set that's just about to fall apart and it's, you know, how do you keep things around? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think what I what I do here is is a mixture of different things, really. But I mean it is primarily a drum restoration and repair business. And that covers um, the kinds of drums I'm working on range from very, very old things to very recent things. Obviously, the more recent things, uh, the more recently made things, I'm not restoring them per se. I'd be doing sort of modifications or adjustments or emergency repairs to them. But the older things, things pre-1980 or thereabouts, which I, I think most sort of collectors agree is where the sort of term vintage drums doesn't really apply to things that are made maybe after the 1980s or, I mean, it gets pushed along a little bit Mm -hmm. further all the time. And we see people now collecting, you know, 80s Tamas and 80s Pearl kits and stuff. They're starting to, they have some kind of a uh, appeal to them for some group of people. And I guess in another 20 years, those will be classic instruments of their own. But the majority of what I do here is repairing, restoring vintage gear, 1960s, 1950s kits, a lot of that kind of stuff. Awesome. Um, and making a couple of ancillary sort of products as well to use as part of that restoration or sell as standalone things such as drum heads that I make. Um, but I mean, the way that I came to start doing this, I guess, was that I, I started out as a drummer um, and then I sort of just ended up on this side of the industry because I tinkered for a long time restoring things while I was studying music and initially aspiring to be uh, a working player. Um, That didn't work out exactly how I hoped it would, but I'm not really too disappointed about that because I think where I ended up is where I sort of prefer to be. Sure, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, so so that's sort of, that's sort of how I got into it. I started as a drummer and um, after I'd finished my degree, I I sort of just started to focus more on repairing and restoring things. And uh, a lot of the drummers that I knew, from my time playing and studying music, um, started to bring jobs to me to repair and it sort of grew from there. And I think now the, the sort of point we're at in history, I mean, obviously these older instruments are only getting older all the time and that makes them in a way more desirable for people. And um, the rarer they get and the older they get, the more people want to have them or want to look after them. I think there's a shift with people starting to think a little bit more about older instruments as being a usable working thing that they can not only sort of admire as some artifact from the past, but something that they can actually use to record with and something they can use to tour with. And I don't think that happened quite so much. I mean, specifically, we're talking about drums. So I don't think that happened quite so much even 10 or 20 years ago. I think that's really sort of coming into its own at the moment. Um, And I hope it stays around forever. I think that um, definitely people are starting to... um, develop a new set of values towards older instruments, which is really good to see. And I guess that's something that's um, created a a need for the kind of work that I do. Yeah, definitely. Now, I think it would be really interesting for you to kind of tell us, um, I've done some, you know, tinkering myself a little bit, but when I see what people like you do, it's like, all right, this is the real deal. Like I've never done bearing edges. I'm terrified to drill holes. Sure. Why don't, You kind of tell us a little bit about like what that process is. Like if someone were to uh, maybe stumble upon like, let's say 50s, I think that's, you know, that 60s stuff is, you find it and it's still in pretty good shape, but like 
maybe I stumble upon a yes. 50s um, Slingerland kit or Ludwig or something, and it's not in good shape. What should I do? Like, what would be, um, in assuming people have the skills, but I would just like to know your process a little bit about how you bring it back to be a player. I think before you do anything to a drum kit as a restorer, you have to make a series of decisions. And there's kind of a hierarchy to the way those decisions need to be made. Um, the first thing I would look at if someone brought me a drum kit, so we'll use your example of something from the 1950s, the biggest thing that can be done to an old kit to affect its value or to affect its appearance is, is removing or changing the wrap or the finish around the drums. And I mean, a, dr a drum kit is a huge sort of, um, it's a huge canvas to display art or an image or a color bigger than pretty much any other instrument you'd have on a, a yeah. stage, you know, Ex except maybe like a grand piano maybe, but you, sure. You don't see grand pianos dressed up the same way as you see drum kits, unless you're Elton John or something. You know, mo most grand pianos look more or less the same. Yeah, <laughs> I think he had one covered in astroturf or something. Yeah, or like shag velvet shag pal carpet. But most people don't have that. But most people that have a drum kit, they do have a drum kit that looks kind of interesting and has like a sparkle finish or a pearl finish or uh, you know an interesting sort of uh, inlay or lacquer fade. Drum kits look, one looks very different from another. And that's that's been happening from the very beginning of the invention of the instrument. Very early on, um, drum kits were changing color all the time and companies were bringing out new colors and new wraps and new ways of sort of uh, inlaying or overlaying the wraps. Um, and, you know, we, we think what we have now is sort of, we, have, we obviously have a lot of variety of different drum builders and different drum wrap and color options and stuff, but, if you go back to the 1920s and 30s, this was an era where drum kits also looked really amazing and, and they were changing these rap colors all the time um, because the drummer back then was a real showman, a real show person. Um, that, you know, this is the vaudeville and silent film kind of era where a drummer had this massive sort of kit. And I know, you know, people like Kelly have talked to you a lot about this, this kind of thing, all the sort of the traps, the bells and whistles and sound effects and stuff that they had to carry with them. and. There was a lot of work for drummers and um, I guess there would have been some element which probably still exists now to a lesser extent of having the bigger, more showy kit might get you the gig wow. <laughs> in a yeah, way. Really. And, um, and uh, consequently, you, you see um, a, lot of the, a lot of the kits that were made in those days in the 20s and 30s, the colours changed so quickly that not too many were made in any single color. Of, of course, there were some colors that really did stand the test of time and just, you know, kept being produced again and again. But there were some really unusual things that were brought out, like um, Leedy had a color called Oriental Pearl. I have some drums in that finish. It's, a, it's exceedingly rare. And then there's things like um, the Autographs of the Stars finish yeah. that Leedy brought out, which had all these sort of, I don't know if you're familiar with that one. It's sort of like a light blue color with all these sort of, yeah, quite yeah. literally the, the autographs of various well-known drummers all over it. And um there's things like the the Ludwig top hat and cane finish. Now, some of these wraps, if if you're a collector or you're enthusiastic about vintage drums, um, people will will know those those wraps or have seen an image of it and know that those things are rare. But I think what some people don't realize is just how rare those wraps are. And I mean, top hat and cane. I think I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but there's there's it's something like seven or ten complete kits known to still exist. <laughs> Gosh. in the world of, of in that rap. So it was only made for, you know, let's say one year or something. And then they decided that wasn't fashionable anymore, make something else. And who could possibly have predicted that that would have gone on to become some coveted collectible thing in the future? Um, no, nobody would have thought that back in the 1920s and 30s. But of course, now we look at these things like it's just the absolute holy grail of um, collectible drums, right? Yeah. Um, you can't necessarily say the same thing about a 1960s super classic in Silver Sparkle. I think that's still an amazing, beautiful, precious thing that should be preserved and looked after. But of course, far more of those were produced than these, um, some of these rare 1920s outfits in rare finishes. But the first decision, getting back to your question, the first decision you have to make when a drum kit comes in is... Um, is based on, for me, that wrap. Is the original wrap still in place? And is the original wrap in good condition? Um, 
in good or in salvageable condition. And if it is salvageable, and if it hasn't had any major modifications made to it, such as the big one is extra holes being drilled, mm-hmm. um, and if it's not you know covered in cracks or splits and it hasn't sort of drastically faded beyond um, a restorable point, then I would usually encourage my clients to have me preserve what they've got rather than change the wrap. Can you make a wrap that's faded look better? Uh, you can, with some types of wraps, you, you can improve their appearance if they're, they're faded. Um, now, different drum wraps are constructed in, in different ways. So you have, you have a few different categories. You have your sparkle wraps, you have pearl wraps, um, you have oyster wraps, and then you have flat colors as well. Sparkle wraps are con- the way sparkle wraps are constructed is that they're they're three layers. There's three different layers there. There's a there's a backing material um, which is usually white or black, and then you have your sparkles over the top, which with only a couple of exceptions is always a silver sparkle, silver glitter, or silver fleck. And then the color the color that forms green sparkle or gold sparkle or blue sparkle comes from the the third layer, the top translucent film, which has a tint to it. So if you take that top layer off, all of these sparkles look exactly the same. They're all silver sparkle. So silver sparkle, by the way, is just a clear layer over the top. So you're seeing you're seeing the color of the the, the silver glitter underneath. Um, but all of those other colors come from the top layer. Uh, one one exception to that is champagne sparkle, which is actually formed with with a mixture of silver glitter and copper actual copper flakes. Um, and then with a clear layer over the top again. So these, these sparkle finishes, it's not, it's not easy to restore them once, the, once discoloration has occurred. Once that top clear layer starts to yellow, which happens over time, we've all seen a silver sparkle drum kit that started to look like, you know, like ginger ale, it's yeah. sometimes referred to where it's kind of yellowed. That's very, very hard to return back to silver. On the other hand, when you have oyster wraps or um, pearl wraps, black pearl, white pearl, these kind of things, um, the way they're constructed is like I use this analogy sometimes to explain it to people of imagining like a salami. Um, So you have this, the way they used to make them, I mean, the way they still make them is they sort of form a giant um, pool of molten plastics. And when that plastic reaches sort of, the kind of appearance they want in terms of the mix of these different bits all being swirled together. Obviously, if you mix something together too much, it's going to just turn into a big one single flat color. So they're letting different bits of plastic dissolve in this sort of soup until it's just bordering on melting into one thing, but not quite. It still has some sort of separation to it. Then cooling it down into this giant big solid block and then running that block through, imagine like a big sort of deli slicer machine, basically just taking veneers off the block. And that's what gives these pearl wraps this sense of kind of um, dimension to it, this sense of this sense of depth. You know, when you look at a 60s oyster wrap or a 60s pearl wrap, it looks like there are some bits further back than others in it. And, you know, some bits are sort of reflecting the light in different ways. And it's a very beautiful thing. Now, these pearl and oyster wraps, the real advantage of them being um, constructed in that way is that because the material of the wrap runs all the way from the front to the back without this separation of different layers that you have with the sparkle wraps, if the outer face of it starts to yellow or fade, you can actually polish away that top layer and work backwards to some of the um, the, the wrap beneath, which is still in perfectly good condition. And the way I go about that is by sanding it. Um, I mean, you'd be there all day if you just were trying to polish that with a a rag or with a a buffing machine you need to be be quite abrasive about it but i mean that's a that's a pretty harsh thing to undertake on your (laughs) your drum kit to start (laughs) sanding away at the wrap it's definitely something you need some some experience and understanding of the technique to do it and when you're sanding um it's it's easy enough to start sanding away that that yellow and that, that that yellow sort of hazing or fading and get down to the wrap beneath. The hard thing is then to get rid of all your sanding lines and bring it back to a, a nice glossy polished looking fillet finish uh, and make it look like you were never, you were never there in the first place. Um, and that's something that just takes a little bit of time and practice. And it involves, you know, starting with a coarse sandpaper and then moving through finer and finer and finer ones all the way up to finishing off with a polishing with a, um, a buffing machine or a hand polish as well. 
Hmm, to gosh. get that glossy sort of luster back. That's fascinating. So some some wraps can be restored in that way, but but not all of them, unfortunately. Um, so that's that's one way that a wrap can be restored. In terms of preserving it, there are there are different definitely um, things people can do to sort of reduce the chances of their wrap deteriorating. And a classic a classic one is leaving a drum kit set up next to a, a window that might mm -hmm. have sun coming through it. Um, on a regular basis. And I mean, the UV has a big effect on drum wraps. Um, it can make them shrink depending on, uh, again, different wraps react differently to, to heat and um, UV, but oyster wraps are really prone to shrinking and splitting and cracking. Um, and some other wraps are really prone to going yellow if they're exposed to UV, like we were just talking about. So making sure you're storing your drums well and traveling with your drums well and not leaving them set up in sunny or hot spots. These are things that will really slow the deterioration um, of a drum kit. If you still have your original wrap in place and it's not completely ruined, it's it's always something I would do is to try and encourage people to, to maintain that wrap if they can. Um, in terms of that hierarchy I was sort of talking about before, I guess the next the next level after you've sort of after you've sort of assessed the wrap and gone, okay, we've got the original wrap in place. The next thing to check for is, is extra holes. And extra holes is something that's so common on vintage kits because, of course, back in the 50s and 60s, the, the kind of hardware that most of the companies were making, uh, although it looked great and had a nice sort of style to it, it really was no match for the hardware that came along in the, the 80s in terms of its strength and durability and, um, uh, I mean, we're talking about when companies like Pearl and Tama really upped their game in the beginning of the 80s and started to become serious players in the, the Western market, which they, which they weren't so much um, prior to that. Um, and the kinds of hardware they released uh, was, was quite different to what companies like Ludwig and Gretsch and Rogers and Leedy had been pr producing in the earlier half of the 20th century. And it was a logical step for a lot of people to go, well, why wouldn't I drill... A hole in the top of my bass drum and and put this pearl omni mount or whatever on there and hang the toms off that because that's going to be a lot stronger and a lot of people wouldn't have thought at the time that they'd be i mean probably no one at the time mm -hmm. <laughs> would have been thinking this is going to have a detrimental effect on the collectability of this drum in another 30 or 40 years time yeah um and, you know, you know, we were talking about top hat and cane kits before. <laughs> I remember seeing like four or five years ago, Don Bennett in um, Seattle, he had a top hat and cane kit for sale on, on his website. Um, and it, it, had been, <laughs> it had been drilled at some point for a Pearl OptiMount. Oh like, my God. Can you, can, you imagine, <laughs> can you imagine that happening? Like if you could wow. just go back in time and just be there and, and find the person that did that and just say to them, listen, I know you don't realize it now. <laughs> but what you're doing to this drum is the is is a, a crime against humanity. Yeah, it's blasphemy, <laughs> and you, you you have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you know people didn't think about that, and and you, you, it's not reasonable to expect that they that they should have either, because um, people don't necessarily think about that now with the drums that are being made now. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, who knows in 50 years' time if drums that are being made in 2019 are going to be as desirable or as um, revered as 1960s drums are or 1950s drums are now. I don't think they necessarily are, but nevertheless, people still, it's very hard for them to picture the future or something going on to become a collectible or anything like that. So yeah, sure. these extra holes are absolutely... The, the the presence of extra holes is just so ubiquitous with vintage drums. You you see it all the time that they've been drilled for a, a mount or the addition of a a muffler or um, yeah all sorts of things. Also on snare drums, you know a lot of changes with strainers and butts and stuff like that. Um, so that's sort of the next level in that hierarchy of decision making. So once once I've sort of assessed the original wraps there. Um, and I've made a decision, well, okay, the original wrap's there, I should probably preserve it. If that original wrap is present, but it's got extra holes in it because someone's drilled it for some mounts or something like that, then it's easier to justify um, any decision or inclination from a client to want to rewrap it or to change the finish altogether. Once that originality has been taken away by the holes being drilled, that's when you can start to move down a different path towards perhaps changing things slightly. 
Um, and when, I mean, I've spent a lot of time over the years, I mean, I guess I spend less time on there now than I did in my younger days, but, but over the years, I've spent a lot of time on, on forums with people talking about vintage drums and just listening to collectors and um, seeing the stuff that they're sort of showing each other and the stuff they've been working on. So I've developed sort of a sense of, of what, what this hierarchy is, what this order of events is, or, or these things that you can do or, or should or shouldn't do to a drum kit um, in terms of preserving, maintaining its value. Um, and definitely the two big ones are changes to the wrap and the presence of extra holes. Now, do you fill various holes from time to time? Like, let's say I want to keep my wrap and there's some holes. Would you plug them? Or, and I guess that question also goes for if you're going to rewrap, you would then go through the process of plugging the holes, I would imagine? Yeah, absolutely. So once, um, if you do have extra holes and, and you've decided that you, you're going to fill them or let's say you're going to strip the wrap off and, and, and rewrap it, then definitely at that point that those holes are going to get plugged. And I see a lot of drums come in here that have, have had some restoration work or perhaps some attempt at restoration work done on them in the past. And of course, a lot of, a lot of that is DIY work. It hasn't come from another restorer necessarily. Um, and there are a lot of different ways of plugging up holes, but it's, it's something that's not easy to do in a, a very good way unless you have all the right tools. Mm. So you see a lot of holes that have been plugged up with, you know, we, we would call it here bog, but it's, it's like body filler that the mm -hmm. car guys would use or the builders would use. Um, it's a very chalky kind of material and it's, it's a fragile material as well. It's not designed to just fill in a, a hole. It can just be pushed straight out of that hole with not very much force, you know, it's like yeah. it forms a little plug that can just be popped straight out. But you see a lot of that going on and you see a lot of, um, on smaller holes, people just cutting off sections of dowel and putting them in. The problem with cutting sections off dowel is that the grain is running in totally a different direction to what grain runs on the drum. The, the plug needs to be cut um in the opposite direction to that hmm. um so that that involves special cutting tools which cut out perfect circles and a lot of the time the the holes that you're plugging won't be perfectly round either so it would usually be necessary to actually drill out that hole to make it a nice sharp perfectly round hole with a very crisp edge to it um before putting your matching sized plug in there hmm. Um, if it's not a round hole, you know, one example is, um, uh, Gretsch stop sign era, um, Gretsch drums, you know, they had these Tom mounts that was sort of like a ball joint kind of thing going on. Um, if you take one of those off the drum, the hole that's actually there is more of sort of like a rounded rectangle kind of almost like a racetrack kind of tablet shape. Sure. Um, to fill that hole, you can't cut a perfect circle for that. You, you need to cut, uh, something by hand. So th there is, there is sometimes a need to, to cut out a plug that's sort of a very bizarre kind of shape. And I would, I would do that by sort of holding my piece of donor, donor shell up on the inside of the, the hole and then tracing it. So I've marked out the actual shape I'm cutting and then using a, a small tool called scroll saw, which can cut out um, a, a very intricate little shape. So then I'm making a sort of odd, odd sized or odd shaped plug to fit into that hole. All of that would happen before the new wrap went on, if the if the job was a rewrap job, um, and then uh, yeah, glued into position, sanded back so it was perfectly flush. And then once that wrap's gone over the top of that, you would never even know it was there. Usually, with any plug, no matter how well you do it from the inside of the drum, it's it's going to be um, possible to to locate it and see it, unless the interiors are being repainted. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of 1960s Ludwig drums, they had quite a thick white paint on the inside. So sometimes it's possible to, to hide it that way. It's about really doing the best you can to make things invisible and as tidy as possible. So if they are, if somebody's going to see it, I want them to look at it and say, well, yeah, of course I can see that this hole's been plugged, but it looks like it's been done well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't want them to look at it and say, oh, I can see this person's plugged a hole with a, you know, with plaster of Paris or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. That's not a joke. I've, I've seen, I've oh seen my that. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen everything. So, you, you see these things that pop up and people do stuff. Uh, I've seen it all. Yeah. Seen it all. Wow. Um, I mean, look as, as well, you know, I was saying before, like you can't criticize people for, for drilling holes in their drums back in the old days. Um, yeah, I, I think the same can be said about people making a DIY attempt at, filling a hole or something like that. People are trying to do the best with the equipment that they have on hand. And yeah. um, 
So, and you know, that's part of my job is not only fixing things that haven't ever been repaired before, it's fixing things that someone might have had a go at trying to repair, but just not not been able to do it that well with the tools or the skills uh, that they had at hand. So plugging holes is is definitely another big thing that happens. And, my, you know, moving along on that sort of hierarchy of decision making, once you've, once you've sort of observed that things like the wrap have been changed or holes have been drilled in a, a drum, that's when you're sort of in a position where it's like, okay, well, I've got kind of a, a blank canvas here. I, I can kind of do whatever I want for this person. So if, so if somebody's coming to me with a drum and saying, oh, I want to have this rewrapped in a, a new color, I would need to assess those things first because if the drum was in perfect condition, I would really try and I think I have kind of a, a duty as a restorer to kind of make people aware of what they've got, not just to do whatever they tell me to do. And of course, ultimately they have the, the final decision. It's their drums. It's not about me having my way, but it's sort of about me making sure they're educated if they're, if they're not really sure what it is they've got, making sure they know all of the things they need to know before they make a decision. And usually the vast majority of people that come here with drums for me to restore will, will be open and receptive to that. They're, I don't really get people turning up saying, I want this wrapped in um, purple sparkle <laughs> no matter what and I don't care what you yeah, say. You're they're, doing it. <laughs> they want to know. People... Yeah. Yeah. You're doing it. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> they, they, they want to know that they, they, they're, they're hungry for information if they don't already have it. Um, and they want, they usually want to do the right thing by the instrument. So if, it's a nice position to be, I mean, it's, it's always sad to see drums that have had these, these things done to them that, that have taken away from their originality. But for me as a restorer, um, you know, I wouldn't have a lot to do if I was only brought drums that were in mint condition all day long. So it's mm -hmm. an exciting moment for me to be to be brought something that's in this state where it might have a lot of extra holes or it might have had the original wrap um, taken off it and replaced with something else or not replaced with any new wrap at all that gives me a nice sort of blank slate it, it means I can start at a point of going okay great we we need to work back to getting this um, towards looking how it would have looked um, when it left the factory 50 60 years ago or whatever um, and in terms of putting new wraps on, you know, a, th a thing I see a lot with drums that have already been rewrapped once is that they they get wrapped in colours that were not an option with the, with that brand or in that era for that brand. Yeah. So you try and stay true to the actual piece of. I, th I think you should stay true yeah. to to the to the brand and to the to the era as well for yeah, sure. Definitely. It's, it's it's something I think is really important. And usually when I suggest that to someone, they would they would always go with that. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it just looks ridiculous not to. Um, yeah, definitely. It's it's yeah. It's the big like we were saying at the beginning. It's the biggest thing you can do to a drum kit to change its appearance is to take the wrap off, put a new wrap on, or change the paint or whatever. That that's the biggest thing you can do. Everybody's going to see that. Yeah. Um, and of course, your your average person on the street is not going to know or care what color your drum kit is or whether that is uh, was an offering from WFL in nineteen. 57 or whatever, but, <laughs> yeah. but people that are collectors or interested in vintage drums do know that stuff. And, um, I, th and I think the community of people that, that know and understand that stuff is getting bigger, even though it's a tiny community of people. I think that that's getting a little bit bigger all the time. Um, so yeah, I think it's important definitely to steer people towards period correct colors. And the, the really great thing is that there are still a lot of those colors still being manufactured and that they, they are really decent replications of, of the originals. I mean, unfortunately, some of them are long, long gone or the, the replications that are being made are just really not the same. Uh, an example of that is the, the classic Ringo finish, the, the um, Oyster Black Pearl. I, I don't know why it's so hard for them to achieve it, but the, the Oyster Black Pearl that's being made now, it just, it just does not look the same mm. as what 60s Oyster really looks like. It doesn't have that same depth. But yeah. curiously, the the pearl, the pearl finishes like white marine pearl and the black diamond pearl, um, they really do look like the 60s ones do. They're really decent um, replications of them. And the same goes for the sparkle finishes. They're, there's almost no difference whatsoever. So those are really great options. Um, I mean, they don't suit every brand, but in, in terms of Ludwig and WFL, Slingerland, they were using a lot of the same wraps, these pearls and sparkle finishes through the 50s and 60s. So, so they're... A, they're definitely a go-to option that I would offer people. And I have, you know, hundreds of swatch samples here that I can show to people so they can choose and get a sense for um, what kind of wrap might be an option for them. Now, do you think it's it's 
it is important for someone like if, if you were going to rewrap someone's set with a you know period correct rap do you think then if that person sells that drum set they need to note to whoever buys it this is a rewrap this is not original if that buyer can't tell do you see that as being like something that you need to um like information you need to divulge to the the buyer or what's your thoughts on that absolutely absolutely i think you should um yeah, I, th I think you absolutely have a duty. The, there's no real rules, is there, when when you're selling something on on eBay or Gumtree or yeah. a forum or whatever. If if, if you don't, I, I think what's really a crime is if you say this is in original condition when it's definitely not and yeah. it's a rewrap. Then you're being dishonest and and that's that's not okay. If you put something up and say, hey, I've got this 1965 drum kit for sale. And you don't mention that it's a rewrap. Well, yeah, I mean it's a little bit sneaky, but also the 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 onus is on the the buyer to sort sure. of understand what they're looking at or to ask questions. Yeah. Um. And yeah, I yeah. mean, look, I've had. I I, th I think that's really the way it should work, and the the way people sell things, they're, they're you're obviously trying to sell your item and make the most you, that you can out of it, and and that's your prerogative as the seller. So. <laughs> That's okay, but I think if you're saying that something's original and hasn't been changed when it definitely has, and we've all seen that kind of stuff go on online, yeah, that's that's yeah. not okay. No, um, but I think the great thing now, you know, is sort of the the place, the marketplace for secondhand equipment used to be eBay, um, and that's just really not the case anymore. I mean, that it is, it still exists, of course, but um, the real place that it's happening now is on Facebook is yeah. on forums. Yeah. And we were all, we were all told, you know, sort of five or 10 years ago, oh, that will never work because there's no safety net there. Like who's going to save you if something goes wrong, you, you need to have this sort of fabric of the, the eBay, um, protection umbrella or whatever you want to call it. Um, but the, the power of the, the mob is, uh, is a, is a is a mighty thing, and um, people people on these forums vouch for one another, and they shame one another if, uh, if yeah. something doesn't work out. Absolutely, and, you know, it's there's a good side and a bad side to that, but the good side is that it actually overwhelmingly is a, is a pretty reliable place for people to buy stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, especially if it's within your sort of community or within your your country. You know, it's, you're taking a bit more of a risk when you start sort of going overseas, I guess, but um, yeah, that, that's where people are doing their buying and selling. And I have seen people on there do things that are really dishonest. And I've also seen the the mob come along and um, rip those people to pieces. And then <laughs> yeah. that's sort of the end of their selling career. You know? Yeah, no, so, I, I regularly see guys like Brooks Tegler on the um, Slingerland group who goes on eBay and posts this is not a 1959 Radio King throw -off. Yeah, <laughs> It's like, it's like he's, he's the watch guy. The watchdog or people like that where they say watch out this isn't real and um i was involved in a rogers scam That's right. that was happening on uh on facebook and like 15 people said oh that guy said he was going to sell it to me he said he was going to sell it to me and this guy i don't know what his angle was yeah. but he was just trying to get people to buy this rogers set and everyone was like well this isn't real and we all kind of came together and said okay let's not do that this guy's sketchy we found it out together and uh it's great it's the community and it works, right? It and, works. and we never, none of us thought that that was possible even only a few years ago. We thought, oh, if you don't have sort of the safety of PayPal and everything, then so many things could go wrong. And it's, you know, it's the internet. It's, I don't really know why, but it's scary and it's not going to, uh, you know, I, we just shouldn't do it. We just need to use eBay. But that's just not the case anymore. And it, it yeah. really is working out fine. And it's, 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 it's thanks to guys like Brooks doing that as well that sort of keep it. You need people doing that definitely, so that the people that are do think that they can get away with some scam, um, they just won't ultimately. Yeah. You know, some some years ago, um, five five or six years ago, I I had a guy that I I did quite a bit of work for, and the work was always him bringing me orphan shells, um, and sort of piecing together kits that were rewraps, and they were made of sort of bits and pieces that were never a kit to begin with. But you know, going to, back to what you were saying a moment ago, it was sort of like. As far as I was aware, anyway, this was all declared and it was above board. And it's like, yeah, he's not pitching a an original condition kit to someone, but it still has a sound and it still has a vibe and it, it it's you know suits a working player or a yeah. studio owner or something like that. And there's a market for this particular thing and it's fine. And then one day he asked me if I would um, take a Slingerland bass drum. He had a couple of Ludwig Toms. He wanted me to 
plug the lug holes on the Slingerland bass drum and drill it for Ludwig lugs <laughs> and um, do, do a rewrap on it and repaint the interior so there was absolutely no evidence of the plugs at all oh. and then badge it with a Ludwig badge so that it could match up with these toms. And that was the last time I worked for him. I told him that I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it because it was, uh, you know, I considered that highly unethical to be, yeah. to be a part of that. Jeez. It's like a rebirthing. It's like a drum rebirthing, you know? It's <laughs> yeah, like, you can't do that. <laughs> totally. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, some I, I, I could have done it and I could have made it look good, but it would have just been, it, it's the wrong thing to do. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's sort of a lazy, a lazy way of making money as, as well, I think, to, to, mm. to throw things together like that rather than trying to find an actual Ludwig bass drum. But um, no. yeah, definitely that stuff does go on. And I think definitely there is, there's, there's a responsibility that a seller has to make certain declarations, but there's also, um, you know, you have to educate yourself as a buyer and there's a lot of places that you can, you can get that information online now by joining these forums or just hanging around like I did for years before I started actually working in restoration myself. Yeah. No, um, I take, just listening uh, to the, I take comfort knowing that you're using your powers for good and not for evil. And, uh, and we can... I, I, so far, so yeah. far I'm only young, you know, but yeah. so far I'm only using it for good. Yeah. Maybe later, <laughs> maybe you'll switch. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see when I'm old and jaded. Yeah. We'll carry on with your hierarchy here. So we got um, the rewrapping. We got hole drilling you're checking for. Where do we go from there? Okay, so another big one is the bearing edges. And this this is a thing that I think it, it, it falls... In terms of the in terms of the the hierarchy, there's no denying that bearing edges is is probably the third thing there that can be done to a set of vintage drums that might affect um, the likelihood of a collector wanting to buy it because it does change the the originality of it. The reason I think bearing edges are a little bit of a gray area is that the way bearing edges were cut up until I'd say, well, I'm, with some companies it still continues, but um, really up until sort of sometime in the seventies, I don't think anybody was cutting bearing edges that were really very good at all. And there was less uh, understanding, I think, about what a bearing edge really did for a drum. Um, but there was also less or perhaps even no expectation from the customer that the bearing edges would be in good condition and probably no understanding from them either of, of how that really affected the tuning or the tone of the drums. But now that we do have the, and I really think that the, by the way, I think the Japanese absolutely pushed, pushed us along on that front hmm. uh, into a world where having bearing edges that were cut well was considered um, normal and <laughs> and reasonable to expect because you know up until of, of course these these companies like Pearl and um, Tamo or Hoshino before that um, and Yamaha they they've been around for a long time and they they made some some pretty cool looking stuff back in the 60s as well and then of course we had the era of the stencil kits I, I know you you did a, a really cool episode on um, made in Japan stencil kits um, but their, their game for a long time through the sixties and seventies was sort of kind of sort of creating a, sort of a sort of, no, I guess you would call them knockoff versions of American kits yeah. uh, that, that were quite cheaply made. The, the shells weren't made out of particularly good wood. Um, the castings for the, the lugs and the other hardware were, were pretty sort of, um, cheap and nasty compared to the quality of the American gear. And then all of a sudden we get to the eighties and, um, that all kind of changed and they started making drums that were of a really high quality and were starting to be used and endorsed by Western musicians, which of course made a, a big difference and made them serious players in the, um, the marketplace. Um, but the quality of what they produced and the level of detail that they go to, I think was something a little bit different to the Americans and the British in some areas and bearing edges is one that I definitely notice. And, um, I still see that all the time today. Like if you take a, a Yamaha stage custom or uh, a Pearl export, which are obviously a, a lower line, you know, sort of pretty much entry level for those two brands. Yeah. Um, and if I take the heads off that and place the drum on its bearing edge on a surface plate, so a surface plate is like a, a, a dead flat tile or a granite slab in some cases that a, a, an engineer or a machinist or something might have to check that something's absolutely level or straight. And I have one of those here for placing drums on. And if a bearing edge isn't good, uh, 
and you put a drum on there and then shine a torch down inside the drum, you'll see light coming through dips and arcs and dents in the bearing edge. And if it's really bad, you can even, you know, place your hand on on one side of the, the top edge and you'll find that the drum rocks because it's not sitting flat on the, the tile. Um, but what I've noticed is these Pearl Exports and Stage Customs, they usually have pretty much perfect bearing edges. That's <laughs> and, interesting. Um, it's... The, the thing is, if you have the tooling to cut a bearing edge, which all of these drum factories have and which I have in my workshop also, it, there's, it's no easier or harder to cut a good or bad bearing edge. If you have the tooling, you, you might as well just cut a good one. Um, and it's, it's a real mystery why in the old days they, they didn't really quite get that. One thing I, I think was a contributing factor is that um, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head how Ludwig was cutting their bearing edges back in the the 50s and 60s but I know with Slingerland the way they cut them was that they actually had the drum on this sort of lathe apparatus where the drum was sort of on its side um, spinning around and somebody would hold a lathing tool against the bearing edge to form that contour to form that profile rather than running it running it around uh, a router which is mounted in a table the advantage of doing it on the router table is that there's absolutely no way, as long as you've got everything true and level to begin with, there's really no way that you can wreck that edge once you've got it to that stage because your table yeah. is level and your router bit is kind of tracing the edge of the drum shell. When you're doing it on this strange sort of lathe apparatus, you can end up with some weird dips in it. Um, now, after after sort of after Beatlemania took off and um, and I mean we all know the impact that that had on the Ludwig Drum Company. Um, the Ludwig was just producing drums so fast and in such great quantities that, I mean, there's a lot of stories, but the, <laughs> the, the, the general consensus is that quality control went out the window a little bit after 1964 and drums were just going out the door fast. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a bit of exaggeration to these stories, but also there's no doubt that, that, that it had a massive impact on, on their business and production really skyrocketed. And um, I see a lot of Ludwig Toms from that era come in here and I'll place them on this surface plate, this checking tile that I was telling you about before. And I've seen, um, without, without any exaggeration here, I've seen dips in bearing edges that are, that are as extreme as a snare bed on the, on the bottom of a Jeez. snare drum. And, and that's, that's in like in a 12 inch Tom, you know, mm. and that just shouldn't be there. No. Now, in terms of that hierarchy I was talking about, if you have bearing edges that are that bad, is it, What's the right thing to do there? Should you should you preserve that that terrible poorly cut thing that's making it very hard to tune your heads, um, just for the sake of preserving the originality, or should you have them recut so that they're perfect and then you can stick a head on there and get the drum tuned up and sounding phenomenal in you know a minute? It's that's that's a hard decision to make, and I think there's there's a real grey area there. Before you go on, can you just so everyone is on the same page, give a brief kind of scientific description of what the bearing edge does, just so everyone's on the same page, what that actually does for the drum and why it would be such a big deal, like what it would affect. So what is the purpose of a bearing edge? Sure. Uh, I think that there's a lot of, that there's a lot of science and there's also a lot of pseudoscience behind the, um, the sort of function, the purpose of a bearing edge and what they do. I think some of it is a little bit of marketing hype and, and that's happening more now than it was in the old days. In the old days, I, I don't think there was any talk about bearing edges. Like when I've looked through old catalogs or old sort of um, like old magazines, like Leedy Drum Topics and some of these sort of gazettes that were put out by companies in the, the early 20th century, they don't talk about the bearing edges, you know, or here's this latest like solid mahogany shell with a round over 45 to give you this kind of sound. But nowadays it really is something that gets talked about or it gets mentioned in most um, drum magazines or drum advertisements, or if you go to, to a trade show or something, it's something that they'll talk about as a selling point for their drums. So I think part of it's marketing hype and I think part of it's real. And the, the bit that's real is that different, what the bearing edge does is it transfers the vibrations of the drum head into the shell. And uh, the rounder that a bearing edge is, the more of a muted, warm tone you're going to get uh, from your drum. And the sharper the bearing edge is, I mean, this is this is in the most simple kind of terms, the sharper it is, the more projection you're going to get from the drum. The more of a head sound you're going to get, the more the drum just becomes a vessel for projecting 
the the vibration of this head and that's the philosophy that sonor really has and the, the way they've always marketed themselves is that um that, that that's what the drum is doing it's just a resonant chamber for the the drum heads and their bearing edges um are subsequently very sharp um but up until the 70s most companies weren't really making drums with sharp bearing edges they were making them with quite round edges and then you know as we started to move into this era of like stadium rock or or much bigger concerts where things needed to be louder and equipment just wasn't made to to deal with it like i mean i'm sure you've seen that footage of the beatles playing at shea stadium you know it's like it's the beginning of it's the beginning of bands getting so big that they need to play in baseball yeah stadiums yeah and they just do not have the equipment for it and they're like they're relaying the sound of the band through the the baseball announcer like the thing that plays the dirt 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 they've got yeah. the, like that thing is what's that's what's taking the sound of the beatles up to the the back of the stadium it's like totally ridiculous and um you know and there's no such thing as proper drum mics or any of that of any of that kind of stuff so as we move into the 70s things got re-engineered a little bit to try and make them louder the focus was just about like let's try and make this stuff louder and with the drums apart from making the, the size is a bit bigger. The other thing they did was change the bearing edges to a sharp profile, um, which just aided projection a little bit. Um, so there's definitely a difference there between, and I find that all the time now people will bring me even modern drums where maybe they just don't quite like the sound they're getting with a sharp bearing edge. So we might switch it to a rounder bearing edge or, or vice versa. The thing that I think is just a bit of um, marketing hype or, or it's, it's become marketing hype, but it, it wasn't really in the old days. It was just that different factories had different tools or different ways of doing things um, is the different angles that they might have used on this this inner cut. So, you know, generally with most bearing edges, there are, there are some exceptions, but with most bearing edges, you have, uh, it's a combination of an inner and an outer cut. So on coming from the outside of the shell, you might have a, a rounded sort of bullnose kind of um, profile. And on the inside, you, you have a, a 45 degree cut. I mean, this is this is a example of a Ludwig roundover edge from the 1960s. Roundover 45, we call it. So the edge that's contacting the drum head is the round part. Um, the bit that's not contacting the drum head is the 45 degree cut on the inside of the drum, which just sort of gradually tapers away into the resonant chamber that is the inside of the drum shell. Uh, now, Gretsch used a, used a 30 degree inside cut. And if you look at some British companies from that era, they were using even shallower ones like 15 degree or 20 degree. Um, I think the differences in sound that you would get doing a 30 degree roundover or a 45 degree roundover are probably imperceptible to most people. Hmm. I think really the only reason that was happening is that just different factories had different stuff. And I think that's the case with things like interior paints as well. And of course, they've become synonymous in a way with certain brands or we think of Gretsch with their silver sealer and they, you know, each company spins some story about how that affects their sound. Yeah. And if you could scientifically analyze, uh, analyze these things with um, some some kind of machines or whatever, then maybe there would be some difference that this particular paint created compared to some other one. But that's not why they were doing it. It's just they one day started using silver paint and that became the Gretsch thing and now they keep doing it. And that's, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, and I think it's the same story with bearing edges as well. Got so it. the function of the bearing edge is to transfer the vibrations into the drum shell and the different, the different shape, a different shaped edge will do that in a different way and give you a, a different sort of sound. And I think the nice thing about a round edge is that it really brings out the full tone of the wood of the drum that your uh, shells are made out of. And in the case of 1960s Ludwigs, that was three ply mahogany, uh, mahogany poplar mahogany, or in some cases, mahogany poplar maple. Um, and there's a real rich, timbre to those drums most people i'm sure would agree and um a, a part of what brings out that beautiful richness is those round over edges so when people do make that decision to recut much in the same way as the the sort of rewrap decision that we were talking about before i would always encourage people if we do go down the path of recutting let's not put a you know a sharp 45 like yamaha style edge on this 1960s ludwig downbeat let's make sure we're true to the era and cut the edge that it always had, but just cut it the way it should have been cut to begin with. So yeah. it's a nice, perfect looking 60s edge. Um, and the reality is that even though that does affect the originality in some way, the majority of people want their drums to be playable. Um, 
Now, it, it would be a very, very different thing if somebody brought me, you know, let's use that top hat and cane example again. If somebody brought me a top hat and cane kit, there's absolutely no way in the world we'd be going about doing anything to that that would affect the originality. And that includes the bearing it just because it's just, it, that's a museum piece. It's a collectible. Yeah. It's not yeah. something for taking out on the road. And anybody that owns that is not going to be doing that with it. <laughs> no, It's a different thing though with these 60 super classics because there's a lot more of them around. Um, yeah. Got it. Got it. No, that's fascinating. Now, yeah. th this is going to be probably a stupid question, but how, like, how many times can you actually... Um, redo the bearing edges because you have to be shaving off some of the drum are you losing any of the the actual like dimension of the drum there is that that makes sense is that a thing yeah you are and so you you have to work to the lowest point so if you imagine um you know i was describing a moment ago this uh, a tom a tom shell that had a dip in its bearing edge as deep as a snare bed so you know it was it was honestly about, about three millimeters depth so what's that like an eighth of an inch yeah. Um, that that's a that's pretty extreme, <laughs> but that lo the the low point of that that three millimeter depression in the edge that's going to be the new highest point. Mm. That's what I have to work to. So the, the the first step in in preparing to recut a bearing edge is getting everything on the same level plane, which involves you know I have this again a very dead flat table set up that's covered in a huge sheet of sandpaper. And the drum gets turned against that until everything is taken down to that lowest point, until everything's on that same level plane. So that's called truing the shell. Once it's true, then you can move to the router table and start cutting the new profile on there. And that will remove the sort of flatness that you've created by through the sanding process. Um, so to answer your question in, and using that example, that would take three millimeters depth off the drum. But that's very extreme, and the reality yeah. is that most drums don't don't have issues quite that bad. So the the amount you would be reducing the depth of the drum by would be very very small. And recutting bearing edges is not something that needs to happen, you know, again and again throughout the life of a drum. It usually happens because they were cut very badly to begin with, or because someone's decided that they're not quite getting the sound that they want out of their drum, and um, perhaps changing wanting to change to a different profile or I might've advised them to change to a different profile. Sure. Um, it's, it's not something that you need to worry about, oh, well, what's gonna happen when I come back the next three times to get the bearing edges recut and my drum's just gonna slowly turn into piccolos or <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. That, it's, it's nothing to be concerned about. And, and even in the most extreme case where you do have this sort of extreme, um, this kind of very deep snare bed-esque dip in the bearing edge, um, it's you you're still not really losing that much got it off the off the depth you know yeah it's, yeah. it's not going to have a detrimental effect on things cool where do we go from um bearing edges so i think th those are really the main key things in, yeah. in terms of the decisions you have to make when facing a restoration on a drum kit i mean there's a lot of other s smaller sort of um factors that I might encounter along the way. And then there are some other sort of gray areas as well. So, I mean, along with the bearing edges, which are a bit of a gray area, another one that I see collectors debating about a lot is the repainting of bass drum hoops. Um, the problem with bass drum hoops, I mean, with some companies, they're still made the same way today, but in particular back up until the, you know, sort of the end of the seventies, the kind of paints that they used on bass drum hoops for most companies was not particularly durable and even with a very durable hoop with a, even with a very durable paint rather on a, a hoop they're so prone to to damage because we're clamping our pedals on there you might be clamping cowbells on the top or tapping your sticks on there um when you're carrying a bass drum around it's it's an an awkward ungainly thing that you're likely to bump into doors with and yeah the, the hoops end up chipped they end up damaged and chipped very very easily once a kit has been fully restored, a thing that can really let down its overall appearance is having really kind of ratty looking hoops on there that haven't been refinished. Um, and again, if it's something that's very, very collectible and very, very rare, you would preserve whatever you're working with. But in the case of things that are slightly more generic or more common, like a, a, a 1960s Slingerland or Gretsch or Ludwig, um, 
repainting the hoops is something that I see people debating all the time, but it, it seems to me that the majority of collectors uh, tend to be okay with the idea of the hoops being refinished because that has been a, a, an opinion of people, I think, for a very long time and and hoops have been re, repainted often a number of times throughout their existence. I see that a lot when, when these old kits come in for restoration. You can see it, it's very easy to tell when hoops have been repainted um, once or often even more times than that. Um, so that's another decision to be made is whether or not the, the hoops should be painted and am I going to affect the value in doing that? Um, and then another one, which doesn't happen very often because it's, it's prohibitively expensive, but I actually just finished off a big job doing this for someone this week is, is the re-chroming or the replating of metal parts. Usually it's a fairly pointless thing to do because obtaining better condition old stock parts for a, a cheaper price is usually possible on forums <laughs> yeah. um, than the cost of getting them re-chromed. I'm sure. Again, though, getting stuff re- re-chromed or re-nickel plated or whatever the plating happens to be, um, although it ends up looking absolutely amazing, it takes away the originality. That's not the original plating that was on there. You know, it's a, it's a similar thing to changing the wrap in a way. You know, you can take off green sparkle and put green sparkle back on, but it's not the ori- original green sparkle anymore, even if it looks identical. Most collectors don't like the idea of things being replated, but again, that decision eventually rests with the client and it's just about me educating them about that stuff and about the, the decisions that are available to them or, and, and just trying to steer them on a path to, to getting the not only the best result in terms of how it looks, but the best result in terms of maintaining the asset they have and um, not wrecking what they have. There's something very special about something that's like, it's original. Even if it's not 100% perfect, it is still beautiful. And um, I personally like seeing that yeah. this is the nicks and scratches from, you know, 80 years ago on this drum set. And um, and I think there's kind of right now, as we've been sort of talking about this whole time, is there's definitely a resurgence of people finding interest in these old drums. Um, are you seeing that as well? Like Absol- in, it's absolutely growing and growing more. Yeah, it really is. And that's that's an interesting thing. I think that, um, like we were saying at the beginning, obviously these things are getting older, so it makes sense that we're coming into an era now where they're becoming more collectible. But I don't think that's the only thing. I think, I, I think the other thing is that there's just a shift in the way. Um, it, it might only be a small percentage of people. We, we're talking just specifically about drummers. So it might only be a small percentage of drummers, but that small percentage has grown just a little bit more. The, the people that are steering away from buying the mass produced big brand stuff that's accessible and um, available and easy um, and moving instead towards maybe just digging up something a little bit more interesting or a little bit more unique or something that takes a little bit more work and understanding. I think the reason that's happening is because of the internet. I think it's it's really is as simple as that, yeah. and, which is, is it's kind of an interesting um, it, it's kind of interesting to, to have something so modern pushing along something so old. But yeah, but um, yeah, that's fine. I, I think that's re- really what it is. You know, I, I was having a conversation with uh, um, a drummer friend of mine a couple of weeks ago. We were out, out seeing a gig together, and he went through the the conservatorium here in in Sydney and and did the jazz course there. Like I don't know, ten years ago or maybe a little bit more. And he was just commenting on how the kind of the caliber of drummers coming through the con now is just like, there are so many incredible young drummers coming up now and 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 so many more than in his day was the statement he was sort of mm-hmm. making. Um, and, and he was attributing that to the internet as well because <laughs> the information is so accessible to people now and drummers can just sit down and watch extensively um, concerts and clinics and um, interviews and they can watch Instagram live streams and they can talk, they can have Skype lessons with, you know, anyone they want. This stuff is so much more like it's within reach of everyone now where it it really wasn't in the old days. You would have had to wait, especially here in Sydney, you know, if if you were a jazz drummer wanting to see some of, you know, you sort of your great American heroes or whatever, um, it it would have been a long time waiting for them to come through town. Um, It's it's just not like that anymore. And that's, that's had a big effect on the level of musicianship. 
And I think the same things happened with people understanding and collecting and taking an interest in vintage drums. They're talking about it online. They're seeing them online. They're learning about them online. Um, so that community of people that are um, that are more inclined to buy a vintage instrument is getting a little bit bigger. It'll always be much, much smaller than the people that will buy the off-the-shelf brand new Yamaha or Tama or Pearl. Um, but something that I think is interesting on that front is to see a company like Ludwig, which obviously is so sort of heavily steeped in legacy and history and, you know, their their whole marketing angle is we were the company that was there back then and did this thing back then, right? Yeah. And um, and and so they should because the, the contributions they made and the the – the, the part of history that they were uh, that they contributed to or that they formed in some way is is huge. It is, yeah, it's huge, and it's significant. And if you had that card to to play, you would keep playing it. <laughs> You'd keep showing it for yes. forever. And but what I think is really cool is to see that, of course, we've you know we've had over the last twenty years Ludwig sort of reissue doing the kind of the John Bonham reissue or various sort of Ringo reissue things or like um, Van Halen kind of things or whatever you know just sort of just sort of remind us all oh this was this this great person that once endorsed our brand or or still does and this is the you know the way our drums looked back in the seventies and all that kind of stuff. But the thing I think is cool now is that you, you see guys like um, like Carter McLean who. I mean, he's only just recently moved to Ludwig, but obviously he's he's one of their sort of fairly big, high-profile endorsing artists um, using their newest gear. But if you watch a lot of his Instagram um, clips or his YouTube channel, you'll see he'll just as regularly pull out a very old Ludwig snare or he'll be playing on his Ludwig club date, like it's an actual 1960s club date kid. Um, and... I think that's that's such brilliant. Um, I mean, look, I'm not suggesting that those aren't just the decisions of, of Carter himself to want to do that, but that's such great marketing for Ludwig as well because it's saying, like, you know, we're still making drums, but there's nothing wrong with our old drums either, you know. Yeah, and no. Look, the people that play our drums, they, they, they play both. It's not about just going out and buying the new thing all the time. And I think it's so nice to see that from a big brand. Um, but... Ludwig has Ludwig has guys like like um, Uli Salazar working there now who are who are cluey young guys that 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 just understand um, what the current sort of marketing climate is like and and that's what it is people have an understanding and an interest in these old things and a, and more of an appreciation for it now and I think you know I'm always trying to you're talking before about something having a few sort of scratches and nicks and that being in a, in a way kind of a beautiful thing that that can be sort of appreciated and, and treasured and shouldn't necessarily um, be something that 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 turns someone away from wanting to own it. Um, I'm tr- I'm always trying to kind of foster in people this this understanding or this appreciation of old things and why they're why they're important to to have and to to own and to look after for the future. And I mean, in a way, I, I don't think I really know. I don't, I don't know why it's important. It just feels like it should be. And, and maybe it's going to become apparent to us further down the track. But for now, it just feels like there's, we, sh- we shouldn't throw this stuff out and we shouldn't just go and buy a new thing all the time. And I, I don't want it to sound like, I, I, I think I'm probably sort of in some ways a bit of an, an apathetic person in, in terms of sort of consumerism and, and environmental management and that, that kind of stuff. I do care about that stuff, but that's not sort of the angle I'm coming from here. Maybe some people would be. Maybe it's, you know, trying to sort of move away from a throwaway culture of buying new stuff all the time. And that's great and that's admirable. But for me, it's about the preservation of the, the history and the um, the sort of the legacy of things. And like there's this thing that I that I do in my, I mean, I work here by myself largely. So I have a lot of time to just ruminate on things and th- think about stuff <laughs> all day while I'm working. And, and some of that stuff is, is a little bit crazy, I guess. But a thing that I find myself doing a lot when I'm working on an old instrument is I think about all the stuff that's happened in the world in the time that that instrument has existed. Yeah. And I, I know this is like, it's a bit of a strange existential way of looking at it. And the, the reality is with drums that, I mean, when we're talking about the drum kit anyway, that it's not a very old instrument and 
you've already had conversations with guests that have sort of gone into the history of the evolution of the drum set with you. And it really doesn't go back that far. You know, it's only, we're only talking about the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so when you compare drums to like violins or cellos or, um, yeah, or I mean, other types of drums as well, like timpani, for example, sure. they, they go back hundreds of years, which, which isn't the case with the drum kit. But still, even going back to the 1950s or the 1960s, that, that is kind of a long time ago. And a, lo- a lot of interesting stuff has um, happened in the world in that time. Um, let me, can I tell you a story? Yes, please, please. <laughs> I, guess that's what, I guess that's what I'm here for. Um, so I had this, this, this one particular drum that I, I like to use as this kind of example when I'm sort of getting people to, to, to encourage this kind of thinking with people. I had this drum, I guess it was two or three years ago that a guy brought in. Um, and it was it was made in 1894, um, and it was a French. It was a, this beautiful brass French marching snare drum, but it was kind of like it was a shallow a shallow marching snare. So it was like 13 and a quarter inch diameter, some sort of weird. You know, this predates uh, standardized head sizes. So it was 13 and a quarter inches or thereabouts, four inches deep or something. Just a, a fairly small sized marching snare. Everything, including the hoops, made out of beautiful, beautifully formed brass with a nice uh, hip rest and a, a nice sort of ornate hook for the shoulder strap to, to latch onto. And he still had the original leather shoulder strap, which was definitely in no condition to, um, to use because it was you know, badly sort of perished and deteriorated. But he had this beautiful old brass snare drum. And this belonged to a guy, a French guy in, here in Sydney who had provenance showing that his great-great-grandfather had owned this drum in France. I can't remember what the story was about how he came to own it, um, but they had some connection to the maker. And in any case, it was um, known that this drum was owned by a family member of his and there was a maker's mark, sure enough, on the drum as well, showing that it was from France, from this era. Um, And I thought to myself like a lot while I was working on it, um, just about how old this drum was. Um, now the work on this drum was kind of, I guess what we would call more conservation than restoration. So, so not so much sort of changing its appearance or getting it to look shiny. And I certainly wasn't, you know, buffing this brass up to have a mirror finish or anything like that. It was a bit more what you were referring to before about sort of just keeping it just as it is and not letting it get worse and, you know, appreciating that, yeah, it's got some scratches and dings that it's, it's incurred over its, um, you know, more than a century of existence, yeah. but this is, this is an amazing thing. And uh, it, it's something that I sort of ponder in my head a lot. And I don't want to sound like, you know, sort of like, it's a bit of a cliche to sort of talk about it in a way like, oh, you know, imagine the stories this thing could tell or whatever. It's, it's an inanimate object, but <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's just about for me imagining this, this timeline of what has gone on in the world in this period of time. And, you know, that's 1894, so that's like 125 years ago that this drum was made. But I have this sort of thing that I figured out in my head of like all this stuff that's happened in the world that makes 125 years sound so much longer than we might think at first glance. And it's one of these things where you just need to let it sink in a little bit. But if you think about 1894, you know, it doesn't really stand out as a year in the same way as like 1945 or 1969 or some sort of key years where we're like, yeah, that's a year in history that a big big thing happened. But if we jump forward a little bit to 1914, so the the drum is 20 years old already in 1914. And 1914 is the beginning of World War One, right? Mm -hmm. But World War One, um, most people probably would know, started when um, the Archduke of Austria, Franz Ferdinand, got assassinated. And that, that was in Sarajevo in, in Bosnia. And I've been to the, the bridge where this happened and it, probably a lot of people listening who've travelled through the Balkans would have, would have been to this bridge. And it's, it's an unremarkable kind of spot. It's just this, it's pretty much in the centre of town. It's a beautiful old, it's called the Latin Bridge, I think. It's a beautiful old bridge in the middle of Sarajevo. And this is where, essentially, where World War I started. This, the Archduke of Austria was assassinated and that started the war. To go back from there to 1894, what's interesting about the connection there is that the guy that assassinated Franz Ferdinand, he was born in 1894. Oh man! So the, so the guy that basically the, the guy that essentially started World War One, he was a baby when this drum was being made. Oh, wow! That, like that's for me, that's a big thing to think about. Oh yeah. I mean, 
in a way, in a way, I guess you could say, well, it doesn't matter whether that guy was born or not because he was part of an organization that Franz Ferdinand was going to get assassinated either way. That's possibly quite true, but there are certainly a lot of other things that have happened in the history of this drum where it really was down to the existence of this very particular person. It wasn't just a case of if they didn't come along, someone else would have kind of thing. So anyway, we can move on through history. Um, so if we get uh, six years into the life of the drum or seven years into the li life of the drum, we're up to 1901. That's a significant year here in Australia. That's that's the Federation of Australia. So that's when all of the states which were individually um, governed or individually administered became uh, a, a unified, um, the Commonwealth of Australia. A couple of years after that is 1903 when the Wright brothers are flying their first successful, um, you know, their amalgamation of canvas and broomsticks or whatever yeah. they knocked their plane up out yeah. of getting it getting it off the ground for 10 or 15 seconds but successfully taking off and landing a motorized plane for the first time like that that happened in 19, 1903 and that's really it do, in one sense it doesn't seem like a long time ago but you know it feels like obviously for you and me who've, who've never lived in a world that, that didn't have planes they they feel like something that's been around forever but they weren't and when this drum was made they certainly weren't hmm. that's that's incredible i think to think about this drum being around in a time when there was when no, people couldn't fly um and then of course we move through yeah we're up to world war one so we move through world war one that starts and finishes world war two starts and finishes. and when world war two finishes the drums are already more than 50 years old so that's that's 14 or 15 years older than than I am at the end of World War II. And I think that the wars are interesting in, in this particular instance to take note of because this was a marching drum and it was French. So it's it, there's no way of knowing, but I, I wondered, you know, I wonder what this might have been doing during either or both of those wars. Was this used in some um, sort of military band or some cadet band or a school band? Was it part of some kind of rallies or... Um, parades that had anything to do with either of these wars or did it just sit on a shelf somewhere in France while war was raging all over Europe like it's it's interesting for me to think about that that this thing is was sitting there or being used possibly throughout this period that now we have so much sort of uh, just a montage of imagery that that plays in all of our heads even our generation that was never there we all can picture things from those wars because we're just exposed to it all the time in life yeah um and then, the, I mean, so this is already up to 50 years or so. And then we're sort of getting into the 1950s, 1960s. And I just want to make a little disclaimer as I get to this this section that, you know, I'm about to talk about the Beatles. And I think the Beatles is in one way a very, um, it's, a, it's kind of a fairly obvious or fairly pedestrian sort of, sort of reference to like <laughs> to be talking about music and then, you know, just use, use a reference to the Beatles all the time. It's like, it's like that... Um, What's that thing, you know, that um, Godwin's law, like where if you're having an argument on the internet, it's only a matter of time before someone references the Nazis or Hitler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, it's going to happen. But no, they're, they're huge. It's like. It, a, it changed it's, the world. It's like a nice, a nice version of the Godwin's <laughs> law, but they're, they're a big thing and they're, they're so connected to this. In particular, they're, they're re they really are a relevant reference point when it comes to drums because the Beatles and more specifically Ringo had such a profound impact on the growth of um, the Ludwig Drum Company and um, just, I, I think, the interest the general public had in taking up playing the drums. Um, so, so we're talking about the Beatles now. <laughs> <laughs> so so th this is interesting. So just to use so, so, some Beatles sort of, so, so, some Beatles years or statistics to sort of highlight the age of this drum, that the Beatles didn't even come into existence as a band until this drum was 66 years old. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the, another way of looking at that, the, the drum existed for more years before the Beatles began than it has existed since the Beatles ended. Oh, so, you know, wow. if we think about when the Beatles played the, played the rooftop concert at Apple Records, you know, 1969, I think, that that is a long, long time ago. And it's a long time before you or I were born either, but that's a shorter amount of time than the drum had existed before the Beatles started. <laughs> Man. And no, no, Beatles, no, member, no member of the Beatles was even born until this drum was 46 years old. Uh, 
And the drum not only predates the birth of all the Beatles, but it predates the birth of all the Beatles' parents. <laughs> and and one one last thing, one last Beatles thing, just to dr- to drive this point home. John John Lennon, John Lennon's father, and John Lennon's mother. They were all born, and they all lived, and they all died within a period of time that uh, it 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 doesn't even it, it constitutes only half the entire amount of time that this drum has existed. Mm. So that, that's just think about the think about the impact that a person like John Lennon had on music, art, popular culture, politics to some extent, um, kind of the the beliefs of an entire generation. The 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 for him to even come in, into existence, for, for his him to be a, a concept for his his parents to even come into existence, the drum existed well before any of that, <laughs> and well after, and, and it still exists, I, and is still and being well, played, yeah. well after, and it still exists, and 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 think of all the great drummers that have have come and come and gone and died in that period of time as well. You know, all so many huge. Uh, names that we that we all know you know the, the Keith Moon and John Bonham all of these huge huge drummers have mm. come and gone within the the life of this drum massive sort of advances in technology and um progression in in, in societies around the world Te- television wasn't a thing computers weren't a thing recorded music obviously is probably the the biggest thing especially considering what we're we're talking about here like when this drum was made, there was no recorded music. <laughs> like, think of how that's changed yeah. our world. Um, and, you know, I think, and, th- and this is the big one, and I, d- I don't want this to sound too much like, I mean, it already does sound like this, but I, I don't want it to be too much like some kind of, you know, some stoner on the bongs <laughs> just sort of waxing about, <laughs> waxing about like space space and time and existence. <laughs> but th- th- think about this as the, the last point on to just sort of to, to frame how old this drum was. Every every person that's alive in the world today was born after this drum was made. Oh yeah, so that's, really? How many people? How many people are? How many people are in the world? Like seven, B- bill- somewhere between seven and eight billion, yeah. I think. Right? Yeah, something like that. So every every single one of those people was born after the drum was made. I mean, it's obvious if we think about it. We all know there's no one older than 125 years old. But but when you just frame it like that, I think it, it's really sort of, it's almost a little bit scary to think about. And the, the second part of that point, every person that was alive when it was made ha- has since died. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. so wow. that's that's a, that's incredible to me. So through, through all of that, this drum has been a thing that, that has sat somewhere, that has been used by pr- probably multiple people um, and there's no doubt that probably throughout its existence, there would have been long periods of time, and it might have happened a number of times as well, where it got shelved or it just got stored somewhere, maybe for 20 years, maybe for 50 years. But there's really no way of knowing how much of its existence it's spent just sitting doing nothing. Um, but wherever it was and whatever was happening with it, whether it was being used or stored or admired or whatever, it was a thing that existed through all of this stuff happening and I think like we all you know we all think about things like oh the pyramids were built 4,000 years ago that's such a long time ago it's so incredible to think that humans did this stuff that long ago but it's easier I think to think oh 125 years that's not so long ago that's not such an old thing but I think when you really think about the stuff that um, humans have done in the last 100 125 years it's unbelievable like we've we've moved we've really moved forward as a species a lot <laughs> yeah. and um, God. F- for, for better, for better and worse, you know, a lot of good things, a lot of bad things have happened, which obviously I've just highlighted there. But um, th- this, this thing has sat through all of that. And I, this is the sort of thinking I try to kind of foster in people. I mean, it may, it, maybe it's all a little bit too deep, but I, I think I want people to have this appreciation of old things and, and ha- see that there is a reason to look after them. And it's, it's enough for the reason to just be this thing is old and it's been around for a long time and it's survived through a lot of stuff so therefore we should lo- look after it i think that's enough of a reason and i think my my job is like my job is restoring and fixing drums but that's i guess like you could say that someone's job is a drummer but an, another way of talking about it is 
another way of putting it rather is to say, oh, their job is to play music and create art and entertain people. It's, it's quite a different way of saying it, isn't it? Like yeah. you can say, oh, I'm a drummer. It makes it sound quite sort of mechanical. Like it's just, you've got this tool and you do this task. But there's a difference between saying I'm a drummer and saying I create music to entertain people. Yeah. And I guess there's maybe a difference as well between saying I'm a drum restorer or saying I'm a drum restorer and my job is to preserve old things and encourage people to appreciate them and to look after them and, and, and treasure them. Man, um, that is just unbelievable. So, yeah. I mean, I, you've, you've got a... Uh, it, I guess that's a non-tangible aspect of what I do. <laughs> but- <laughs> no, I think if you could get paid for just thinking, I think you'd be a... Uh- You'd be a rich man right now. And it just makes me think about like... Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. It makes me think of how well cra- <laughs> crafted that drum is to be able to last that long. And all of these drums that we're talking about that just... I mean, they'll be around for... I mean, unless they're destroyed and thrown out or burned, that they will be around thanks to people like you, which is just awesome. And um, I've got a lot to think about right now with when I look at a drum. So, um, <laughs> man. So... I think now's a great time for you to tell people where they can find you and if they want to talk to you and kind of just really get into your world and um, possibly throw you some work and stuff if they're around Australia and all that stuff, where do they find you? Yes, certainly. Well, um, they, they can find me in, in all the usual places. So I'm, I'm on, you can find Kentville Drums on Facebook. Uh, and on Instagram, um, but people can email me as well if they want to, if they want to ask me any questions or you know shoot me some details of a project they had in mind. And I mean, I t- obviously the ma- the majority of the work I do is for the the Sydney community or the New South Wales community, which is the state that I live in. But I receive work from all over Australia and quite a quite a bit of international restoration work as well. So um, there's yeah, I welcome I welcome everybody, and they can definitely find me in all those usual places online or on my website. They can contact me through there as well, or or check out photos of some of the the work I do. Hmm. Man, on some of the products I make. Yeah, and you're always doing cool stuff. Um, and it's Kentville, K E N T V I L L E drums. Um, and you can find them at kentvilledrums.com.au. Um, man, it's just like, yeah. just to put it all into perspective like that. Like, I have a snare that was my great, great, great grandpa's from when he was a uh, cadet in boarding school, and someone converted it into a table. As from what I understand, in, wow. in like like with drumsticks as like the um, kind of legs, and I think they converted it in like the fifties. And when I think about that, of like wow, it like I think the drum is from like eighteen eighty, and then to think the fifties was so long ago that they converted it, and it's been a it had yeah. a, it had a life as a table. I'm like, it's just wild and uh it was already it was already a vintage instrument instrument in the 50s exactly already already existed a very long time then (laughs) yeah no you've got a very beautiful way of 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 looking at this stuff and um and i just want to thank you for being on the show today i mean we've got this is i this is a very special episode a because you're literally i'm talking to you from the future so that's pretty wild um but b just this this very kind of like surreal way i'm talking to you from the future you're not talking to me from the future Wait, i'm the one in the future I'm you're talking to me from the past man that's right i was confused yeah, yeah. um so that that drum is a day older where you are that's right think about that oh my god <laughs> think about the millions more people that have lived and died in that one day <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, Steele, I hope to uh, I hope to someday meet you, and our paths may cross. And um, it, like you said before, about the world getting smaller, and just drummers being able to communicate. I think the fact that right now, someone in let's say Brazil could learn about from an American guy interviewing an Australian guy on a podcast and learning about the definition of a bearing edge, it just it's just unbelievable. I think we live in a really cool time. Yeah, I totally agree. You're right. It is getting smaller. It's a cool thing. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And and by the way, like great job on this this podcast. Like I've listened to a bunch of the episodes, and it's um, yeah. I, I have to admit, I'm not I'm not a huge podcast listener. It, it it takes a lot for me to really sort of get drawn into podcasts. But but this is one that I've found absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. So excellent work, man. And I, I love all the, the stuff you're doing as well. Awesome. Cool. Steel, man, I gotta, I, don't, I have to like think about all the things that have happened 
since like drums that I have in their life now. You have to. It's your duty. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> oh, very good. All right, Steel. Well, thanks for being on the show, brother, and I will uh, I'll talk to you later. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>